Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy Chop, and we are back with another unbiased history. This is the Pax Romana. I don't know what the fuck that means, but we shall see. We shall see. Okay, let's get my boy. I love these. I love these videos. Come on, go back and actually read the thing. If you did, congrats. For today, we will be covering the middle days of the Pax Romana. A golden age of unrivaled peace and prosperity. Which brings us to a civil war, where we left off, with Nero having died with no heirs, that is. <laughs> Look at this fat ass. War, where we left off, with Nero having died with no heirs, that is. The treacherous Praetorian Guard declared support for Galba, at the behest of the Praetorian Prefect, Nymphidius, whom offered huge bribes in his name. And just after he had the Senate acclaimed Galba the Emperor, he took Spurus as his own wife, and then the fucker just gave him to Powerlust, and demanded that his men proclaim him the new Emperor, claiming to be the illegitimate son of Caligula. It was Julian <laughs> and shit. <laughs> <laughs> but the bribes Nifidai's promise proved to be his own downfall, making his men kill him and wait until Galba paid them. Speaking of whom, he was still in Hispania, begrudgingly preparing to leave for Rome despite never wanting to be Emperor. But you know who wanted to? Otho that fag Nero had exiled to Lusitania. Apparently he had heard a prophecy that he would one day become emperor, which he interpreted as Galba one day adopting him as his heir. So he began sucking Galba's cock non-stop, but he never did get noticed. He did gain the favor of Venus, Galba's advisor, but that wasn't enough, not that he knew. But when it came to Galba's character, the man was a hardcore disciplinarian. As he consolidated authority in Hispania, he had every single dissident executed, along with their whole families. As he marched his way to Rome, he fined or sacked every single city that didn't show him strict loyalty. And as oh, he neared Rome, I, sh I am sure the people love this guy. Rome, he was faced God with damn. a newly raised legion of ex sailors, whom demanded him to recognize their new status as legionnaires. So he had them slaughtered for insubordination, and the survivors decimated near the Milvian Bridge. Keep this place in mind. Galba's fame as a disciplinarian stretched way back to Caligula's reign, when the god emperor sent him to straighten up the Rhine legions, which he did so effectively that they held a grudge against him for over two decades, which they were allowed to manifest after Galba appointed Aulus Vitellius to govern the Rhine legions. The stereotypical hedonist fat fuck. He ate four full meals a day, threw non-stop parties during duty, and used his scouts to hunt down delicacies across the empire to stop his fat throat <laughs> To assist Vitellius, Galba sent Caecina as a legate as well. And if you think Arminius was a traitor, then take a hold of this pleb. The second he got in the Rhine, he began embezzling and taking bribes non-stop. And fearing Galba's rightful retaliation, he plotted together with another legate, Valens, to mount a revolt. Soon after, they had their men show up to Vitellius and proclaim him the new emperor, and he just went along with it. Meanwhile, <laughs> Galba was getting more and more, more hate from the senators and praetorians, the main reason being that he still didn't bribe them for their support, which, as you remember, he never did promise That's to do. And when the old man Galba me. finally resolved to name his heir, with Otho by his side, he chose a man named Lysianus. And Otho was livid. Drowned in debt and resentful like mad, not a week later he approached the Praetorian Guard, promising them their bribes, and ordering them to kill Galba for him. Later, a conspirator would come to Galba exposing Otho's plot and claiming to have killed him. Mad at the chaos of the situation, he was lured out alongside Valens and Lysianus, where Otho had the Praetorian Guard attack them, killing them all. And while the Praetorians kicked Galba's head for sport, the Senate readily acclaimed Otho the new emperor, with Sporus later taken as the imperial wife. Again, he then started Jesus. going over Galba's mail, only then finding out about Vitellius's revolt against Galba, who had now transferred to him. Otho offered to marry Vitellius' daughter, but he was too busy stuffing his face to here, sending both Valens and Caecina south with his legions. Despite being severely outnumbered, Otho had the luck of Paulinus being in Rome at the time, sending him north with what men he could muster. Paulinus then marched north, holding his position near Cremona and waiting for Balkan reinforcements. Otho then sent the Imperial fleet to raid the southern Gallic coast to distract Valens' army, but all he achieved was killing Agricola's mother. Caecina then arrived in Italy, attacking Paulinus and getting promptly beaten back to Cremona. <laughs> Valens then arrived with reinforcements, alongside 60,000 German auxiliaries. Paulinus kept holding his position, but then another Othonian general, Titanius, took over and attacked Cremona. Contrary to Paulinus' advice, the Othonian forces were then defeated, and having heard of the loss, Otho, seeking to repent for his crimes, killed himself during the night. 
so he could bring the civil war to an end. Kaysina and Balans later captured Paulinus, and, lying through his teeth, he convinced those plebs to release him, leaving his last days in peace. As Vitellius marched south, he passed by the battlefield to smell the fresh blood, later mocking Offal's grave and continuing to throw a parties small non-stop. Grave for a small the Senate man. then bent over and proclaimed to Vitellius the new emperor, who made himself Pontifex Maximus at the anniversary of Brennus's victory before the sack of Rome, and then planned to have Sporus publicly raped in a gladiatorial arena, but he killed himself to avoid the shame. May he Jeez. rest with Nero. So much food Vitellius would eat while ruling, that he literally bankrupted the empire, later resorting to inviting his debtors to the imperial palace, having them killed and their property confiscated. And speaking of debts and money, the Jews were still revolting in Judea, while the emperorship changed hands every few months, both Vespasian and his son Titus were busy ransacking the rebelling Semite cities to the ground. Not by their own doing though, the Jews just kept mass killing themselves every time they breached the city gates, go figure. The last bastion of Jewish resistance was in Jerusalem, but as they prepared to take it, news of Galbus and then Ophos and then Vitellius' ascension sequentially arrived to the east, making them delay their efforts. Having some plebeian land while as emperor was unacceptable to the eastern governors, among them Missianus in Syria and Alexander in Egypt, the who proclaimed the the new emperor, <laughs> convincing the Danubian legions of Illyria, Pannonia and Moesia to join them. Vespasian had never lusted for power, but he changed his mind after discovering an old Trojan prophecy, wildly popular in the east. It said, there will be a time, in the world's darkest hour, when a divine hero will emerge from the sons and daughters of Troy, conquer the lands of Judea, and become the ruling savior of the world. Vespasian could see how well it fit to his current circumstances, and with the blessing of the great heroes of old, Vespasian embraced his new destiny. Among the Danube's legates was a one named Primus, whom took his legions and marched on Optimus Rome without Prime? orders for a surprise attack. With Valens being sick by then, Vitellius sent Caecina to face off Primus, <laughs> which would prove an error. <laughs> Accessing the advantage Vespasian's legions had, he contacted Primus to negotiate a betrayal, but his troops found out and had him locked away in the camp. Reinforced with Vespasian's legions, Primus then faced off the Vitellian forces. <sighs> Engaging in a long night battle, the sun later dawned on them. The Vespasian troops were invigorated by it and turned to greet the sun, which the Vitellian forces took as enemy reinforcements incoming, so they fled the field and left Primus victorious. Primus then continued to march on Rome, and with more and more provincial governors declaring allegiance to Vespasian, our focus goes back to Rome, where Vespasian's youngest son, Domitian, finally comes into the Domitian. picture. Born 12 full years after Titus, Vespasian had his young son raised by his wife and daughter, whom would both tragically die, leaving Domitian under the care of his uncle Flavius, whom raised him with the help of Nerva, a close friend to the family. Being an INTJ to the core, Domitian chose to spend his days alone, reading about history and coming to venerate the first emperor Augustus as his role model, occasionally pinning flies that flew by, as Minerva warned him they were up to no good. So yeah, the mission gave much respect unto the gods, especially the goddess of wisdom, whom retributed it by acting as his guardian deity. The mission was present in Rome as three different emperors took over the city, and witnessed how the senate bent over to their new masters every time. And as Primus approached Rome with his legions, Vitellius tried negotiating with Flavius for a cowardly surrender. But Vitellius' men refused to give up, putting Vitellius in custody and sieging Flavius up in the Capitoline Hill. Minerva then helped the mission to escape, while his uncle bought time for him. Later, Vitellius was brought the corpse of Flavius, being deprived of his last out. Having arrived at the gates of Rome, Primus, hearing of Flavius' death and fearing for Domitian's safety, he ordered his legions to take the city. He eventually breached the walls, and during the chaotic struggle, a fire would break out into the city and consume the temple of Jupiter himself, which he wouldn't soon forget. As Vitellius tried to flee, he went to the palace to get his- Jesus, Rome does have a- uh, does like to catch on fire from time to time, doesn't it? Ah, Much food is jokes. possible with him, <laughs> only to be found and taken by Primus's legion. <laughs> he was brought to the, the Roman the Forum, where he was beheaded <laughs> and his body thrown to the Tiber River. Further angering Tiberinus, but that river was beyond polluted by then. Vespasian then returned from the east and was proclaimed the new emperor by the senate, because of course. Later, as he visited a temple, he was stricken by a divine vision. As two plebs came to help him, Vespasian accidentally conjured a divine healing spell, curing them of their injuries. From there on, Vespasian would be recognized as yet another divine emperor. 
But while his father worked miracles as the new emperor, Titus was left in Judea with the task of pacifying the province and retake Jerusalem from the rebels. He had four legions at his disposal and several auxiliaries against 20,000 fraction Jews behind the walls. Once Titus arrived, he tried scouting ahead but was suddenly raided by the Jews. Bro, what the hell is that thing? Wait, he scouted... He, the, the commander scouted... What? Jews behind the walls. Once Titus arrived, he tried scouting ahead, but was suddenly raided by the Jews, slaughtering several oh. Semites to escape with his life. He then began building a forward camp, but then the Jews raided again, but he repelled them and got it built, encircling the city and officially starting the siege. Oh, he did the legionary the siege, siege weapons were constantly harassed by the Jews, but Titus fended them off until the walls were breached. He led his men through the breach, but the Jews had retreated to the second set of walls and the Antonia fortress behind it and the Temple Mount walls behind it. After a long back and forth, Titus reached the second walls and laid Jesus. siege to the Antonia. As the Roman siege weapons raged, the Jews were up to their tricks again, digging up a cave underneath and setting fire to the foundation, having it collapse on the Romans. And after more back and forth struggles, Titus pulled a Caesar and settled with having his legions complete in building a wall to encircle the walls of the enemy, letting the Jews starve to death. The Jewish factions began to conflict between themselves, ending with the zealots destroying the food supplies of the city, ensuring that they would all either die. <sighs> okay, okay. Die fighting or die starving. And as Titus crucified I mean, his Jewish prisoners alive. Now you're gonna die starving faster than. Five, Jupiter conjured up a storm to smite the Semites, having the Antonia fortress collapse in its weakened foundations. Titus didn't let the chance slip and ordered a charge uphill, but the Jews defended it fanatically. So, the next night, a band of 24 legionnaires sneaked into the Antonia, 24? killed the defenders and sounded the horns. Jesus. Titus then came with his forces and gained a footing in the Antonia, having it destroyed to facilitate a breach. But that didn't mean the Jews were anywhere near giving up. Titus then ordered an assault on the Temple Mount. The Semites used their Jewish magic to set fire to the top, forcing a retreat. Now having lost all restraint, Titus ordered a massive assault through the breach, breaking through and taking more and more of the Temple Mount. And as the Jews were pushed back, a soldier grabbed a flaming piece of wood and threw it over the walls. Shortly after, the fire began spreading, engulfing the Holy of Holies and throwing the Jews in disarray. Titus then broke through the Temple Mount's walls and had his legions slaughter the remaining rebels. Titus would later crush the last pockets of rebel resistance, and as he was acclaimed Imperator by his troops, he sacrificed a bull in the honor of Jupiter, thanking him for this victory. In total, 1.1 million Jews would die as a result according to Josephus, a Jewish historian that remained loyal to the empire. Jesus. But yeah, the Jews as a whole would yet continue on revolting, twice, but no more. Hadrian would make sure of that. Shh, shh, we're getting there. But right now, it's all about Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian, okay. as the Free Flavians celebrated the founding of their new dynasty, showcasing mountains of Jewish gold, the menorah, and the Pentateuch as trophies. The new dynasty's first challenge would be to acquit the 40 billion sesterces worth of money the Roman state was in debt for. You can thank Vitellius's fat throat for that. Among his many tactics to raise money, Vespasian led the senators outbid each other to get positions in government, exploited monopolies for the state's benefit, hunted down corrupt tax collectors, and even taxed the plebs for their urine. Eventually, his son Titus, now the Praetorian prefect and fucking the Jewish queen, he came to think of the tax as immoral. And when confronted by him, Vespasian gave Titus one of the urine tax money coins, and he was disgusted by its stench. Plebeian money always stinks. And speaking of plebs, Vespasian used all that Jewish gold to build a massive amphitheater to entertain the masses, then known as the Flavian Amphitheater, and now as the Colosseum. Oh. You think it sounds better? I think it sounds better. During all this, both of his sons would get married, the mission to his lifelong love Longina, the daughter of Corbulo, who would bear him a child, but he didn't survive long, and Titus married way back when with Marcia, a descendant of Uncus Marcius, and even better, the aunt of a young military genius named Trajan. Oh, can you feel it? We're almost there. Vespasian also allowed for great freedom of speech, <laughs> even allowing some Greeks to link his lineage to one of Hercules' companions, so they could aggrandize their Greek white hero. <laughs> no mention so far was the time when the Batavians, Germans, took advantage of the weakness caused by the civil war and revolted against the empire. Jesus. Among the rebel leaders was a Gaul named Julius Sabinus. Uh, uh, uh. Now get this. 
He claimed that his great-grandmother had been one of Caesar's many cumsluts. He claimed the entirety of Gaul for himself, even getting the germs to help him out. They encircled two legions with their hordes, and once they agreed to accept the surrender, they had all legionnaires slaughtered. Never, ever trust a germ. To deal with this Germanic shitshow, Vespasian sent his brother-in-law to crush the rebellion, humiliating the Batavians and forcing the Larper into exile. The mission had been eager to help crush the revolt, but it had already been crushed by the time the letter arrived. Yeah, what? Vespasian would then spend... What is he saying there? What does that mean? Any Germans in the video view section? Oh, Let me know, please. But it had already been crushed by the time the letter arrived. Vespasian would then spend his later years enjoying life with his boomer friends, such as the naturalist Pliny the Elder, celebrating both peace and victory. And after nearly finishing the Colosseum, he was the one to add that solar crown to the Colossus of Nero, reassigning it in honor of Sol, the Romano-Trojan solar deity. He couldn't quite put it to words, but there was something about it that... Oh wait, this repetition reminds me, we have a conspiracy to cover right now. Yes, even with Vespasian being so likable, there were still those who would betray him. His Namely money? Caecina. Why? Who the fuck knows? Maybe he was half German or something. Sources disagree. But he didn't go anywhere, as Titus was there to do his job. Soon after, he invited Caecina for dinner, and while he ate, he stabbed him in the back. Let none say Titus didn't know irony. And serving the empire diligently, he would hold a total of seven consulships during his father's reign always stepping out of power in the middle of his office in favor of the mission, which only increased his disdain for the senate even more. Back to the promises, Vespasian appointed Agricola as the governor of Britannia, whom had just married his daughter to Tacitus, THE Tacitus, whom he would have recorded his attempt to live up to his mentor Paulinus. As Agricola arrived in the province, he started out by crushing a revolt by the recently conquered Welsh, where he later found an exiled Hibernian king called Twafo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brother. Okay, I. <laughs> no, my God. Asked for his help bar, in retaking bar, bar. his throne. Agricola then crossed the sea. No Why Roman had ever became a midget. Crossed and ran a punitive campaign in Hibernia, Proto Ireland, that is, installing Twafo back in power. But he never bothered actually. Why the is place. he making the Ireland midget? Ireland was, my God. is, and will always be worthless. And as Agricola bravely pushed the borders of civilization further north, he was suddenly attacked by the honorless Picts of Caledonia, the Proto-Scots of Proto-Scotland, that is. Agricola then demolished the Scots in the battlefield, but every time he did so, they cowardly fled to hide in the highlands. Civilizing them would prove an arduous task. Back to the Eternal City, we can see the years haven't been as kind to the Emperor as they have to his friends, now suffering from a terminal case of severe diarrhea. As his life neared its end, Vespasian proclaimed that an emperor ought to die on his feet. Getting up, and after taking another massive liquid shit, the truth dawned on him. Dear me, I think I'm becoming a god. Then falling dead on the embrace of his caretakers. After presiding over his funeral, Titus succeeded him as emperor, later expelling Berenice from Rome, fearing that he would fall prey to her eastern temptations. To further celebrate his victory in Judea, he built the Ark of Titus, the glory of which would make generations of Romabus build replicas for themselves. And as far as the Senate went, they sucked Titus's cock like you wouldn't believe. And there's good reason for it. He abolished treason trials, never exiled anyone over anything, didn't kill a single one of them, and one day, after having given no favors to any of his friends, he deemed it a wasted day. And while everything was going dandy, Vulcanus was sleeping underneath the Vesuvius, until a sword fell into his head. Woken up, he realized it was a gladiatorial sword, aka a slave sword, aka filthy slaves have been fucking about on oh, top of his Spartacus property. Now? Exploding in anger, Vulcanus made the Vesuvius erupt in a furious rage. I fucking told you this would happen. I, I really fucking did. Among the many casualties, oh, this the yeah, 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 who the died Vulcan trying to rescue Europe. his friends yeah, from such a fate. Yeah, Several thousands of plebs also died, but who gives a shit? Well, Titus kinda did diverting massive imperial funds to help out the worthless masses. And to open up some fresh wounds, another great fire broke out in Rome, this time burning Agrippa's pantheon to the ground. And while Titus put down the fires, in the east, a man proclaiming to be Nero reborn emerged, gathering some gullible Greekoids to follow him as he laid claim to the empire. Plenty of Julian Larkin today, isn't there? But this one was no different. 
he would flee his way into Parthia, where he met his end. And after calming down the fires, Tyrus ordered a massive bathing complex built, further indulging the plebs with the architectural wonders of civilization, making him even more loved and respected than his father. But after just two years as emperor, while traveling Sabine lands, Tyrus grew increasingly weak and fragile. As he laid in bed, realizing death was near, he proclaimed to have made only one mistake in his life, and then died. I believe we all know what he meant. What killed him, you ask? Well, Berenice was quite bitter about being scorned, oh, you see, bitch. and that whole destruction of Jerusalem thing too, I suppose. So she used her Jewish magic to have a fly get into Titus's brain, and slowly chew on it over the years. Yeah, Minerva isn't the goddess of wisdom for no reason. Domitian was then acclaimed the new emperor, and as a prelude to his reign, Domitian had his elder brother deified just like his father, without even consulting the senate for approval. Because if there is one thing to be sure about the mission, Massive. was that he absolutely despised the Senate. After years of seeing how the senators treacherously bent over for any usurper who took over power and did nothing but to serve as bootlickers for both his father and brother, he denounced the senators as what they really were, treacherous parasites of no honor, being nothing but an insult to the noble senators of old, of which only Nerva and a few others still lived up to. Being the huge Augustus Buddha he was, Domitian sought to emulate the original princeps in every possible way. He both micromanaged and macromanaged the empire to run as efficiently as possible, elected the most capable men as possible to serve in positions of government, used taxes to build several projects for the public good, threw games constantly to entertain the masses, and of course, persecuted degenerates without mercy. Also, much like Augustus, Domitian spent a lot of time in the provinces, making it clear that imperial authority went with him, and the senators could fucking suck it, often raising their taxes, confiscating their property, and limiting the size of their wine farms, just to fuck with them. Does he get killed by the senate or...? Them. Such was Domitian's hatred for the senate, he would occasionally invite the senators for dinner in a black room, with tombstones as chairs with their names carved on them. <laughs> and they would be killed, <laughs> <laughs> this was a savage. The mission let them go peacefully, satisfied with having tasted their fear. He then used his staggering IQ to fix the inflated economy, increasing the purity of the coins from 90% to 98% silver. And if you're curious why you should care, it's because he will be the only emperor to actually fix inflation like this, with one very notable exception down the line. Then using said fixed economy to rebuild the Temple of Jupiter, and then raising the common legionnaires' pay by 33%, making them love him unconditionally. Jupiter remained pissed though. However, much like Augustus, Need the mission was Jupiter. deeply concerned about the Germanic threat to civilization. For if not even the divine Augustus could civilize those chaotic animals, then the mission settled with the next best thing, pushing the Germans as far away from Rome as possible, and building a series of fortifications to connect to the Rhine and Danube rivers, later known as the Limes Germanicus. And while the walls were still being built, Domitian was viciously attacked by a large German horde, provoked by the smell of constructions really? nearby. The emperor then obliterated the barbarians and kicked them back to their mud huts. He would later celebrate a well-deserved triumph for his victory, and be overjoyed with good news from Britannia. For this whole time, Agricola was fighting his way through Scotland, finishing the conquest of Britannia for Rome, with the exception of the Highlands, where the remaining proto-Scots still cowardly hidden. But Agricola decided to let them be, letting those animals claim to be unconquered in their reservation areas. He would then spend his later years trying to civilize as many Britons as possible, but there would always be left a job half done. Probably and as a reward them. for his efforts, the mission recalled him to celebrate his accomplishments letting the Scots slowly retake their lands. After all, Scotland was, is, and will always be worthless. But you know, not all barbaric shitholes were worthless. Daisha comes to mind. The kingdom in the Carpathian Mountains was filled with gold mines, and sadly, Dacians. They would occasionally cross the Danube and raid Moesia along fraction tribes, cowering away before they met any Roman retaliation. But it all changed with the Cabalus, a barbarian king that killed the governor Moesia and united the Dacians under his rule. Insulted by their actions, Domitian sent the Praetorian Prefect to push them back, which he did, but as he encroached further, the mischievous Dacians ambushed them, slaughtering his legions and taking the Praetorian Eagle Standard. Oh, Domitian shit. then took matters into his own hands, crossing with three legions and continually pushing the Cabalus back, and as he was about to crush him, another revolt broke out in the Rhine. 
The mission was then forced to give lighter terms for a quick peace, appointing the Cabulus as a client king and granting him with the funds necessary to protect his borders against the germs, which he instead, of course, would use to fund yet another invasion of the Empire. What happened in the Rhine wasn't interesting at all, just our average butthurt senatorial conspiracy to score some petty revenge against the Emperor, even allying with the germs to carry it through. Their plan was to let the germs cross the Rhine and join up with his legions, but Jupiter, at Minerva's request, denied their efforts, summoning a storm over the river, thus making a crossing possible. But the real reason why the revolt failed was that Domitian sent none other than Trajan himself to crush the revolt, which he accomplished flawlessly. Unfortunately, the other legate heading the expedition, the like conspirator himself, had all the incriminating documents burned, saving his fellow traitors back in Rome from being discovered. To restore order, Domitian assumed the consulship alongside Nerva and began purging the Senate of any senators he deemed traitorous, Time later awarding purge. Trajan with his own consulship. <laughs> well deserved. Despite his utter hatred for them and great justifications for it, Domitian wouldn't purge much. Hell, fucking oh. Claudius purged more people than he did. But that didn't stop those parasites from fearing and hating him. Indeed, they came up with a plot to kill Domitian. Part of the plan relied on how the mission was long ago prophesied to meet his death at midday, making him lower his guard after such time had passed. And recently, the mission had been visited by Minerva in a dream, informing him Jupiter wouldn't allow her to protect him anymore, being left abandoned by the gods. Feeling vulnerable, he kept asking a servant what time it was before leaving for work, and him, being among the senatorial plotters, lied, saying it was past noon. Relaxed, the mission returned to his office to attend the Empire. He was then approached by another senatorial conspirator, claiming to have discovered a plot against the Emperor, but the injury was a fake. And as Domitian read the document, the conspirator took the dagger he had hidden and stabbed the Emperor, failing to actually kill him in one hit, only then calling the other conspirators to join the attack, collectively stabbing Domitian to death. They, they Yet another him. good Emperor, a victim of conspiracy and assassination. Jesus. Funny how the Praetorians remained loyal this time, one less though. And say, Speaking of good emperors, ciao ciao. Yeah, plenty of bullshit in the outro too, you're right. Let's go over it quickly, shall we? Here's my alt YouTube account for special vids and random stuff like that. Here's okay. my new. Well, um, that was fucking awesome as usual from him. Yeah, let me know what y'all think. And if anyone that is German or knows German, please translate some of these. Thanks for me. I would really like to know what the Germans say in this. <laughs> anyway, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you next time, everybody. Have a nice fucking day.